Hey everybody, it's John Pollock here, and I wanted to take a couple of minutes here to go through the uh, life and the career of Jerry Jarrett, who passed away a couple of days ago on Tuesday at the age of 80. And I wasn't able to do this on Wednesday night for Rewind to Dynamite, as I was uh, I was taken out of that show due to uh, plumbing issues at, at my house. But things are uh, under control today, but I know people are not logging in to hear about uh, those issues. So Jerry Jarrett is among the most influential figures when you're looking at the the territorial era and somebody that it is not a stretch to state dedicated a grand portion of their life to professional wrestling and it is another passing that draws back to a, a bygone era and there is so much history that goes with a Jerry Jarrett that links to the, the days of, of Nick Goulas and Roy Welch and the entire uh, Tennessee, Tennessee state uh, of wrestling and Memphis territory. And, you know, it is not lost on people the significance of, you know, Jerry, Jerry Lawler just having his, his, his recent stroke. And then one week later, Jerry Jarrett passing away. And it is two figures that one story cannot be told without the other. So, so much, um, so much connection uh, between those two. So I, I've spent a lot of time kind of going through uh, Jerry Jarrett over the last couple of days. So I definitely wanted to uh, take some time to talk a bit about Jerry Jarrett. And I would certainly suggest people that maybe are only familiar with, you know, his, his connection to Memphis. There's so much to be learned by diving into a Jerry Jarrett with some of the, the resources that are out there, some some great pieces that have been written on uh, Jarrett that we'll get into. But um, he was born in, in Nashville in 1942, and he grew up, um, you know, a single parent. Um, his parents were divorced at a young age, and it was his wife, Christine Jarrett, that ended up taking a separate job working as a ticket taker in Nashville at the Hippodrome for Nick Goulas and Roy Welch. And that would be, it would not be uncommon that a very young Jerry Jarrett would be there at the, the ticket booth and later working, uh, s selling Cokes, selling programs. Like he was indoctrinated into professional wrestling pretty much from, from the jump. And this was the industry that he grew up around. And Christine Jarrett herself, this would be, you know, among the first female promoters. Like when you are looking at significant female figures in this space, like Christine Jarrett went from a, a ticket vendor to somebody that ended up promoting towns of her own, uh, you know, herself, uh, Eileen Eaton in the Los Angeles territory. I mean, some significant pillars uh, there that um, certainly uh, women to research and, and look at. But that is Jerry Jarrett's indoctrination into professional wrestling. And this is somebody that, I mean, not all that un uncommon for people that uh, were born into the industry, that he wore every conceivable hat, not all unlike his son, Jeff Jarrett, that, I mean, you could write a book on Jeff Jarrett, the wrestler. You could write a book on Jeff Jarrett, the promoter. You could write a, a, a multiple uh, books on a Jerry Jarrett to to that end as well. Just all the different facets of the industry that he experienced firsthand. So he he goes to college and then he is working uh, as a as a purchasing agent at a manufacturing company, but it's. It's in Tennessee working for uh, Roy Welch and Nick Goulas that he becomes an office assistant. And this is where he is called upon for various roles. He would referee. He then started to promote towns for Goulas and Welch in 1958. So do the math. He's born in 1942 and he's promoting towns uh, around the age of 16, which I mean is uh Imagine uh, being in a territory like that, in an industry like this, at the age of 16, and you're the guy uh, promoting spot shows around the territory. So this was somebody that, yes, he he was formally uh, educated at Peabody College, but this was a guy who got his PhD in in Tennessee professional wrestling and would would use his unofficial degree throughout the decades to come. But then he transitions and also becomes a wrestler. And 
the wrestling part of Jerry Jarrett is not often discussed too much, but he was a tremendous baby face, very popular in the territory. And he was trained by Tojo Yamamoto and Sailor Moran and debuted in 1965, had a very good run teaming with Tojo and, you know, for, for all intents and purposes, could have had a very successful career strictly as a professional wrestler, but always had that insight or that that ambition of promotion and ownership. I think this was somebody that understood the importance of having having equity stake in what they are building, and that was what he assumed he was acquiring within, within the Ghoulist territory, but one that ultimately ended up with, with their falling out. But, you know, as he graduates in stature within the territory, he is given more and more... Um, more and more responsibility in the territory. And the key was that he ended up getting to promote the Western part of the territory. And that included Memphis and it included Louisville. And this is at the the peak of Jackie Fargo as the area's legend. And from a attendance standpoint, these would be the peak years for uh, Memphis, which was a Monday night institution at the Mid South Coliseum, and from seventy one to seventy five, this was um, this this was the highest that uh, the Mid South Coliseum would do. Now, television ratings they would they would get larger during you know once once Jarrett breaks away and and the Lawler era and such that we'll get into, but uh, that was a huge part. And remember this, and this is going to be brought up by a lot of people that you know the Mid South Coliseum. It could hold over 11,000 people, and you're attracting that every Monday night. Now, it's not to say they filled the Mid-South Coliseum every week, but there were plenty of years that they were averaging seven to 8,000, and it's so different from today's environment where we might look at attendance trends, but we're talking about national touring brands in WWE and AEW that are going to individualized markets, and if you're somebody in you know raw stopping in Brooklyn Raw is going to have, or WWE is going to have, you know, multiple stops in the New York market per year. But if you're you're only drawing upon that audience X amount of times a year, it's not a recurring weekly event. And it was hitting all of the towns. So not to say Memphis was Greensboro, but it certainly wasn't New York. And it was you know, a relatively, you know, small city in, in the grand scope of major metropolitan areas that would be some of its uh, contemporaries at, at the time. So they're, they're drawing very well at, at this time. And Jerry is largely looking at Jerry Lawler as, you know, the the heir apparent, uh, very much in 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 moniker as the king, but it was essentially like Jackie Fargo and then passing the torch down to Jerry Lawler who would continue on as as the territory's major star. And things come to a boil in 1977 and this is when there's a falling out between Jerry Jarrett and Goulas and you know from from Jerry's side it was that he had he was under the impression that he was slowly acquiring a percentage of the territory and then informed that in fact you do not have that um you do not have any ownership of, of the territory um that's that's Jerry's side and it ultimately led to his exit and he was able to construct a power play at the time that now again remember that this is Jerry Jarrett at about the age of 35 that is pulling this off where he is able to number one he's promoting the big towns in Memphis and Louisville so he knows that he's going to have an in there especially to the Mid-South Coliseum he has also got the area's biggest star in Jerry Lawler but the 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 aces in the hole were that he also was able to get Lance Russell and Dave Brown, both of whom had been with WHBQ, which was Channel 13 in Memphis and the home of the Goulas television program. Lance Russell had been the program director and essentially got professional wrestling onto the station and was very influential. And Dave Brown was the area weatherman that was very popular. And he was able to convince both to get out of their contractual obligations with WHBQ and come over to WMC TV, which was Channel 5, and that would be the home of the brand new Continental Wrestling Association that colloquially just referred to as Memphis. And 
that is what Jerry Jarrett was able to pull off. He got about a third of the roster to jump over. Not everybody, not J- not Fargo, not Tojo, but he he had Lawler, and that was a major key to everything. And he had the familiar voices of Lance Russell and Dave Brown, save for a short period where they, they launched in 77 on, uh, on Channel 5, and Russell and Dave Brown, they had to finish up their, their run at WHBQ, and then... So you, you had several weeks where it was the the local DJs that were involved, uh, Clay Conrad and Bob Young, that were the announcers for the first couple of shows on Channel 5 before Russell and Brown showed up. And it was, they were essentially off to the races where they they knew that um, this, this was going to be, uh, in essence, you had transplanted professional wrestling from channel 13 to channel five and Goulas in time, they would lose their television slot and then go out of business. And it would be the, it would be the Jerry Jarrett territory. And it was all built around Lawler who Jarrett was in very much. So you, you can look at in terms of, you know, Antonio Pena breaking off from EMLL and having Conan as his big star to launch AAA in 1992, Jerry Jarrett had crafted Lawler, who was he had gone away for a for a period of time, returned in '74 as the top heel, and bringing in all the big names to work Lawler, including Jack Briscoe for a real big match in September of 1974, and just building him up and utilizing uh interesting concepts uh Jerry Jarrett was behind the boxer versus wrestler gimmick with Jerry Lawler and Rocky Johnson right before the Anoki Ali fight and promoting Rocky Johnson as a as a legit heavyweight boxer because you know that that kind of knowledge was not uh it, it was it was not known at, at the time but you know the break occurs in 77 you know George Goulas was the son of Nick Goulas and was continually getting uh pushed upon Jerry Jerry Jarrett to to utilize. So this was my understanding is like it, it was a foundational issue that the cracks were forming and it was time that Jerry Jarrett understood that he could make a play on his own and was successful in, in making this decision. Like he he won this promotional war and it was hardly even a war to speak of because he made such a dramatic move that it took all the key pieces off of the chessboard for 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 Goulas. And so they they are off to the races on on channel 5 and another interesting part is that WMC TV channel 5 they were willing to pay Jarrett for the television I believe the amount was around 1500 per week um but but at this time and and this would be something that they would continue to pay for the television all the way up until 97 when they move they move it from a live format to a a, a taped show later on Saturday nights but that's very not on a not not a unicorn in professional wrestling of being paid for television, but very very rare that you would have it would many times, including you know during Vince McMahon's national expansion, it was the opposite of paying to be on television and giving program directors that knowledge that th- these promoters they they need the television and we have the television, so therefore um, the value is to them, even though we're getting reliable programming. 52 weeks a year, uh, live programming in the, in some markets such as Memphis, and as well, it does very good numbers on, on top of it. But th- this was the deal that they had in 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 the launch of this, and their first show is is March 20th of 77. Uh, Jerry Lawler against Bob Armstrong that does uh, over 8,200 people, and to get a sense of where things were. Out of the gate, uh, you have, you know, Jarrett's side drawing 8,200 and Goulas the next night bringing in the Sheik and Bobo Brazil uh, drawing 2,000. So uh, it wasn't even a re-education process for the audience to understand where professional wrestling was. For them, professional wrestling was Jerry Lawler. Professional wrestling was Lance Russell. And the other area top stars, the vast majority of them were now on Channel 5 and it seemed to be a pretty instant changeover. Uh, that they understood. We could spend so much time going through the highlights of Memphis from 77 and over it, it, just as an institution over the next 20 years w- within that market and so much of it, the the big angles throughout. Some of the keys being, of course, uh, Jerry Lawler as both babyface and, and as a heel. When he ends up 
breaking his leg playing uh, football. He is out for a considerable amount of time. And that is when the territory, they rely on Jimmy Hart as the big heel mouthpiece and assembling his first family that Jerry Lawler would feud with. That would be one of the iconic feuds of, of the eighties, the early eighties in Memphis until Jimmy Hart leaves for the world wrestling federation in early 85. So that was, you know, key uh, Lawler and Andy Kaufman, uh, the, all of the, the programs with Bill Dundee and the way it worked was that the booking, you would have Jerry Jarrett book for a period. Then it would go, to Jerry Lawler and then revert to Jarrett. And they had this formula that it was designed as not to burn out a booker uh, that you got sort of, you know, you do your six month sprint and then boom, you get a rest period and the other gets to come on and you could see the difference in programming and difference in styles between the booking. Now they did have a potential fracture in this relationship that was averted when Lawler and Lance Russell at one point were looking to break away from the territory. And what happened was, you know, Jerry Jarrett understood like this was he needed to retain these two figures. And this is when he cut Lawler into the ownership of the territory. Lawler starts in uh, Memphis or sorry, with with Jarrett in 77, where he is the star performer, but does not have the ownership stake. But after this threatened break, that's when Lawler gets half of the territory. Russell doesn't get any ownership, but it was always a contentious relationship um, for years between Russell and Jerry Jarrett over this that with my understanding be that Jarrett, Jarrett understood Lawler being able to pull off something like this and wanting that stake. He did not see Lance Russell as having the, um, having the the stake that Jerry Lawler does to pull off something like this. However, Jerry Jarrett always understood the value of Lance Russell and and how valuable he was to the territory and they did eventually um mend that relationship, but it was it was contentious until Russell leaves for WCW in 89. Uh Jarrett had always said, you know, the peak was 75 to 85 and again, they were averaging 8,000 fans on Monday nights at the Mid-South Coliseum, and they had huge draws in in Lawler and Bill Dundee when the fabulous ones really take off. 1983 was a big year for, for them, Steve Kern and Stan Lane, and I would say up until like 88, that was kind of their last hurrah when Lawler beat Kurt Hennig for the AWA championship. Jarrett then... Uh, merges and 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 buys a world class out of Dallas which was on its last legs and that's the formation of the USWA and it was as you had the, the national expansion uh, of the WWF that was changing the way the industry was from a territorial based industry to a national scene and there were only going to be so many left standing in this national expansion and to their credit, Memphis lasted longer than a lot, and you're going to have differing opinions. Jerry Jarrett was not always the most popular uh, promoter amongst talent. He was able to get through very lean years by paying talent very little. His argument was he had he had a formula, and when business was good, they would be paid well, and when it wasn't, they would not be. It was It was based on how the gates performed, and he was... For whatever you want to say, Jerry Jarrett did not have a ton of, he was not overly sentimental. He was not a promoter that wore his heart on his sleeve. He was a dollars and figures promoter, and he judged things that worked or did not work by the gate figures. And this was going to be, he was not in this business to lose money. This was not going to be a passion project for him. He was not going to be um, just throwing good money after bad very much the opposite of uh, for for instance um you know uh, Kerry Silken that he is an extremely popular figure amongst the the talent because Kerry Silken stay we we never made money during the years that he owned Ring of Honor but he kept that operation going and for that a lot of careers existed and flourished because of that outlet. Um, when you think about it, had Kerry Silken had the mentality of this is not making money, I'm going to pull the plug on this investment. There's probably a lot of careers that don't get to the next stage and national stars that maybe never, never get out of there, that they find work elsewhere outside of the industry. Jerry Jarrett was not that guy. He was not here to lose money. And 
that, that all culminates at the end of the territory where it's pretty much on on death's door in 1997 and Jarrett is getting ready to get out when all of a sudden he gets a call from uh, Jerry Lawler that he wants to buy his share for two it ends up being uh, about two hundred and sixty two thousand dollars from my uh, research here and for Jerry Jarrett it's like this is the ultimate gift from the heavens that I was ready to get out of this at a loss and instead I'm getting a six-figure offer so he ends up selling off to Lawler. Again, he does not have, for, for somebody that had operated this the, his own territory for, for 20 years, did not have the, he was not being, um, he was not losing sleep over uh, the, these 20 years of uh, of promoting, being in, in the rear view mirror and getting out of his, his run business. He was ready to move on and it becomes... Man, if you want to do a Dark Side of the Ring episode on the whole ownership fiasco of 1997, uh, there, there's plenty to dissect between the the sale to Lawler and then his involvement with uh, Larry Burton and then selling to this investment group uh, of the Selkers. It's, it's insanity. And what it ends with is, first of all, Memphis gets moved to out of its live slot, it would air Saturdays live from 11 a.m. till 12.30. It gets moved, and it's a taped show that airs midnight on Saturdays and replayed on Sunday. And then eventually the plug is pulled on USWA in that incarnation. And then you would have the, the spinoff um, territories, uh, Music City Wrestling and, and others that it would always be going back to the tradition of Memphis wrestling, trying to recreate what had been appointment television for so many in the Memphis market on Saturday mornings where it was it was not uncommon for a 60 70 share for Memphis wrestling where the uh, of the televisions on at the time 60 to 70 percent would be fixed on Memphis wrestling for those 90 minutes and and state-of-the-art television for the time it's it's professional wrestling that I think is it it is hard to determine how you would assess how it is aged when you can look back and and I have been watching some Memphis this week and there's some stuff that I mean just the this some of the promo material that would not fly in in today's society to say the very least but at the same time you know Memphis was an interesting territory where you had a lot of other territories that they, they would look down on Memphis like they would there would be like the term like that's too Memphis and yeah they were out there they had outrageous characters they had outrageous angles but it also was a precursor to where professional wrestling was going they they utilized along with with mid-south music videos um uh, again i don't know how well you would do it with the clearance of those nor were they i don't think clearing these rights back in uh back, back in the early 80s but it made superstars out of these guys and that was a big part of the business it was go to the local studio see them in person go to the merch stand afterwards get your polaroids it was a giant uh, merchandising hub uh, territory uh, on, on top of things because th- these were stars uh, on a, on a local level to this community in, in Memphis and then taking it around the loop to Louisville to Evansville all, all over the place so 77 is when Jared is out and the 90s we we cannot overlook his involvement too with, with the big two there's a time when he is both on, he is both being paid by WWF and consulting with WCW. Like there's a several week or even month period where he's getting paychecks from both warring companies. And of course, it is when he moves up to Stanford in the early 90s that he was, you know, from from multiple accounts. It was he was there as a insurance policy policy for Vince McMahon if he's found guilty in the steroid distribution trial of 1994 somebody that was not going to uh, usurp his power that he could trust he had that trust in Jerry Jarrett and that was um, uh, that was from from men, many accounts the the reason that Jerry Jarrett was there uh, but then ultimately leaves the company and did some consulting with, with WCW but he's he's effectively out of the industry for a good portion of of the 90s and you know Memphis would continue in in various iterations and then his name is popping up more and more he's got his own construction business he's also running a a, a television distribution company as well but it is through his son Jeff that is making his waves throughout the 90s and 
the the relationship of Jerry and Jeff, which I'm sure will be expounded upon by by Jeff uh, on his podcast. I mean, Jeff Jeff has never been shy about the fact like him and his dad have had contentious relations over the years. The good news is that over the last number of years, it sounds like it has been a very healthy father son relationship that they they mended. But it was very tough for Jeff. Here is somebody. Let let's remember this. One of the Sticking points with Jerry Jarrett was working with Nick Goulas, who is adamantly behind pushing his son George Goulas. And George Goulas received, you know, from from those that were there, not you know, not not a great wrestler and not and, and somebody that very much was uh, protected by who his father was. And I think Jerry understood that and never wanted Jeff to be in that spot. And that put a lot on Jeff, where he was getting it from both ends, where people in the territory would look at him as the promoter's son but at the same time jerry was not necessarily treating him like the promoter's son so it's like he's not getting any of the benefits but he's getting all the criticism of being the promoter's son like jeff navigating that like we have enough examples of second generation performers that the last name is an anchor not not a a boon to somebody's career and you know, Jeff has told the story that he finds out through his his dad tells him like WCW came to offer you a deal and I turned it down on your behalf. Didn't think you were ready. Jeff had no say in the matter. He's just told this on a, on a bus one day by by his dad when they're coming back from Dallas that yeah you know this is this is early nineties and on the one side it's Jerry potentially looking out for his son. At the other it's you know <laughs> Jeff is one of the stars of the territory that he probably does not want to see go either. But it's it's the relationship of he's my boss but he's also my father and that is a big uh, it's it's a big part of Jeff Jarrett's story on, on top of it. But where Jerry pops up again is towards the end of WCW and he is he is rumored to be one of those interested in buying the company and he ends up Going through the books with uh, Lenita Erickson, who you could read about in the Nitro book by Guy Evans, and also having J.J. Dillon, who's got a very close relationship with Jerry Jarrett. And they make their pitch to Brad Siegel, and from their standpoint, they were willing to spend $70 million to buy the company. And according to Jarrett, they never got a response to their offer. Like, it was just, it just seemed like they had their, their roadmap, and the Jarrett plan was not part of it. Now, you hear the number 70 million and what it sells for, very big discrepancy. The asterisk to all that is that Jerry Jarrett is understanding that with this with this purchase is coming national television clearances that would not be part of the deal and that would ultimately bring down the demand for WCW that if you're not getting the television time, what are you getting? You're having to buy out contracts and you're taking this brand and a tape library and that greatly reduces the number of interested buyers effectively down to one in the World Wrestling Federation. But Jerry Jarrett's idea to come into WCW, I mean, it was, yes, it would of, let's say that even one of the television slots is still there. This was not going to be a great, purchase for talent because Jerry Jarrett was not coming in to maintain WCW. He was in here to slash costs dramatically. Um, You know, from their understanding was that, you know, WCW, it was still bringing in $125 million in revenue in 2000, but the talent costs were through the roof and he was going to dramatically decrease costs. So you would have seen a lot of talent cut, a lot of deals restructured. It would have been an extremely slim down WCW than the one that people were seeing in, in 2000 for, for good or bad. Um, you know, it short term, it would have hurt a lot of talent, but long term to have another national entity survive is for the betterment of the industry. Doesn't happen. Everyone knows what happens there. And Jarrett's last major chapter is the formation of NWA TNA with Jeff, where they form J Sports and Entertainment and both have percentage ownership in the company. And it's Jeff, it's, you know, it's, it's their money that they are putting into this whole thing, launching in June of 2002. And then this was one where if you want to look at Jerry's uh, promotional history, if there, if there was a time that you had Jerry operating with his heart instead of his head, 
TNA would be your example. You can go back and and read various interviews from Jerry Jarrett at the time that he is. You can you could see his concern of how is this going to work? The idea of pay per view on a weekly basis. Now maybe Jerry Jerry is looking at with a foot in the past and a foot in the future. You create your present. What is my past? It was building up Memphis where it was the same audience coming back week after week after week and paying to see Jerry Lawler, to see Bill Dundee, to see the fabulous ones. Can is the modern equivalent of that having fans pay week after week after week for pay-per-view without television. Big, big caveat there. No television. The answer was no. And it seemed that Jerry understood that. It was not a comparison point that, yes, you can probably sell a lot of people on the notion that they were spending up teen dollars on three pay-per-views per month up until early 2001 you had the WWF at 30 bucks a month you had WCW's pay-per-views at 30 bucks a month ECW I want to say 25 a month so yes a smaller circle that you're looking at but that Venn diagram of people buying three pay-per-views if we can get a portion of that, then great. That could be our our inroads into profitability. Uh, did not work out. They were misled with early numbers. You can look into the Jay Hassman case of somebody that was reporting figures that were inflated to what the real numbers were, and that was a blow to the company of uh, thinking where how close they were to profitability versus the reality of things. And by the end of the summer of 02, it looks like TNA is dead, and it is a Hail Mary that a publicist working for them by the name of Dixie Carter ended up <laughs> being able to broker uh, a majority um, sale of the company where Panda Energy takes a majority control. Jerry and Jeff still maintain minority ownership roles in the company, but Panda essentially is coming in to funnel cash into TNA. They will handle the business. The Jarrett's will handle the wrestling. The fracturing occurs where Jeff is leaning heavily on two competing visions. There is the Jerry Jarrett vision of professional wrestling. There is the Vince Russo side of professional wrestling. You can have your opinions, but you cannot coexist with both. And that was the reality. This was oil and water. And it was Vince Russo that won out in, in that. Jerry Jarrett understood that. Jerry Jarrett never understood the relationship of why Jeff relied so heavily on Vince Russo. But in 2002, Vince Russo is coming off. It's almost a push. He has, you have to remember, Vince Russo post WWF was extremely, um, he marketed himself extremely well, and he was considered the guy with the Midas touch. WCW, that Midas touch goes away, but he is still living off of the fumes of the Attitude Era, and this being, he is presented as one of the architects, and with that came a lot of opportunities for himself, including in TNA. So Jerry Jarrett takes a back seat and understands like this is his son's vision and his son is his son is running things like that is like the wrestling operations that is Jeff and the relationship hits its lowest point in 2005 when people might remember logging into WWE.com and this was at a time when WWE.com they were trying to do a lot more uh, kind of legit news and and they would put out you know various stories you'll remember in the summer of 05 suddenly you tune into ww.com there's vince mcmahon shaking hands with bret hart at the stanford studios um and then one day you tune in and there is jerry jarrett in wwe headquarters with this unknown wrestler by the name of oleg prudius who would go on to become vladimir kozlov and your Head is going in a million different directions. What is one of the uh, one of the founders of TNA doing inside WWE headquarters? And if you were a fan thinking that, was it too far off from what a lot of key people in TNA were thinking as they found out about this? What does this mean for TNA? Is Jeff involved in this? Is Jerry Jarrett there on TNA business? Is he trying to broker something? A million questions going throughout Nashville and a lot of this falling on Jeff Jarrett. What did you know? Are you involved in this? And Jeff Jarrett seemed to be as caught off guard as anybody by this. And it was a real um, blow to 
Jeff at the time to the point that he does not speak with his father for years after this meeting. And it was only in recent years that they rehabilitated that relationship. This was, um, it, it was a really bad time. And Jeff has been public about this. It's one thing you can say about Jeff. He, he has not sugarcoated things about his father, the good, the bad, but it does seem like that came from the fact that they were in a good place by the time he could go reminisce about these stories and talk about the the difficulties of being a promoter's son and Jerry putting him in difficult positions, such as this 2005 meeting at WWE headquarters. But that's effectively the last major chapter for Jerry Jarrett. He put out uh, a, a couple of books as well. He wrote about the early days of TNA. Then he put out his own book alongside a uh, Memphis historian, Mark James in 2011, the best of times. And, and did, did various interviews over the years talking about his, his time in the business always seemed to keep his, his finger on the pulse of what was going on in WWE. Uh, Jimmy Hart was on Busted Open Radio this week stating that he had gotten a call from Jerry just a couple of days ago about just out of the blue telling Jimmy how much he meant to the territory, how much he meant to him and telling Jimmy that, you know, let's uh, we'll get together for WrestleMania. Like he was still following the industry right up until the end. And uh, he had been suffering from, from uh, cancer in his esophagus and passes away Tuesday at the age of 80. Um, so. It's, it's a remarkable career that Jerry Jarrett had. Uh, he was involved in, in so many different facets of the industry that, you know, that, that kind of knowledge, it's, there, there's few living figures with the experience, the understanding, the education, the knowledge that a Jeff, uh, that a Jerry Jarrett uh, possessed. Um, and, and I, I say Jeff, because I would put him in, in, in that bag as well in terms of like a modern equivalent of somebody that has worn every hat there is in the industry from from referee to wrestler to promoter to owner to marketer um jeff jarrett falls like there, there's a lot of similarities there between between father uh and son um jerry had had four children uh he survived by his second wife uh deborah and Yes, we wish all our best to uh, the family of the, of the Jarrett's uh, with, with this loss. I would also encourage people to, to check out some of the, uh, the great writing that has been out there. Slam Wrestling's uh, Ryan Nation put out, put out a, a great story on Jerry Jarrett, including some of the correspondence uh, that he had with Jerry over the years. And I thought I'd end with this. This was a quote from uh, Jerry Jarrett to Ryan, uh, again, that you can catch at uh, Slam Wrestling. I thought I had reached the end of my journey last year. This is written in 2006, by the way. And the experience gave me a new insight into a soul's journey through life. When the end comes, you will not measure your life by your money or material possession. And I can say that having accumulated great wealth, you will not judge your journey by the status of position you have obtained. And I can say that because I've had some pretty good accomplishments in both the wrestling and construction business. No, you will judge your life by the content of your character. My relationship with my wife, my children, and my friends are the thoughts that gave me comfort during these trying times. I felt ready to leave this plane because I felt I had been a good dad and a good husband. That was Jerry Jarrett. And thank you for tuning in for this uh, special bonus look at the life and the career of Jerry Jarrett.